Hi, thanks for joining us for another session of explainer videos on semi-passive water treatment for mining and oil and gas. I'm Monique Samer, and I'm going to be talking today about semi-passive water treatment, what it is, and what types there are. So this is our first real video or explainer video in the series. Uh, the first one was just the introduction I did a few minutes ago. Um, I'm going to fit as many of these videos in, in as I can per day because let's be real here, we are in COVID isolation. I don't want to have to do myself up, up get out of my pajamas more often than I need to. Um, <laughs> and I just heard my dogs with his squeaky toys. So you might get some nice little um, interruptions like that too as we go along. Uh, filming here from my home, so thank you for joining me. And let's get to it. So uh, I should mention all the uh, any references information can be found at the end of the video. We'll have some links. Uh, I strongly encourage you to go to mavenwe.com, which is our website, and you can find all this information in a paraphrased transcript, loosely to speak, uh, along with nice figures and examples. Uh, we might even throw in a case study or two. So please go there and check it out for more information. So what is semi-passive water treatment? Well, really, we have to really focus on the semi, I think, because this is something that a lot of people used to call passive water treatment. And even myself, you'll see online, you can find a lot of different uh, webinars I've done before, or even reports I've given, systems I've designed, where it was called a passive treatment system. Now, I've moved to calling it semi-passive, and so has most of the industry in the past while, because we need to consider what, what uh, define this, what is passive? And unfortunately, passive was getting confused with walk away. So um, there was this confusion between a passive system, meaning you can just walk away and leave it, and it continues to do stuff. Now, it will do stuff. Um, there's, I have actually heard of a few uh, scenarios, very unique, where there was walk away. But generally, what do we mean by semi-passive? So I'm gonna go through the types first. Treatment wetlands, which are called so many things, constructed wetlands, treatment wetlands, engineered wetlands. You have different acronyms, CWTS, TS, TW. There's trademark names, there's everything. So you have to really figure out what is it you're actually talking about and um, not generalize too much because there's also a lot of treatment wetlands that are designed for municipal treatment and will not do anything for mining waters like metals and metalloids. So um, I'm going to actually end up doing an individual explainer on each one and what they are and how they work so that we can keep these short and focused on what's most interesting to you. You can pick which ones you watch. Bioreactors. Now these span from being very, very passive through to entirely active. So like anything, all these treatments exist on a continuum and they can be very, very passive or very, very active. Uh, bioreactors, the ones that are normally semi-passive are things like gravel bed bioreactors or um, you can use pit lakes as bioreactors, which we'll see down here. So um, in, situ or in situ bioreactor use like pit lakes or in ground, so not using buildings and that, but the more passive. Um, in situ treatment, like pit lakes, so that's when after mining the pit has flooded and you can treat right in there. Mine pools, which is the underground mine workings after uh, mining. Um, these can, when the dewatering is stopped, the water refills them, a flooded mine pool. Um, saturated rock fills, or SRFs, um, some some people call it suboxic zone and um, just other different names for them. And uh, tailings ponds also can be treated in situ. Now, in situ, that's just Latin and it means in place. So you can actually treat them at the location without having to pump it somewhere else. All of these, when we talk about treatment, need to be considered um, on a case by case situation. What's appropriate for the site, the chemistry, the host rock geology. So there's no one size fits all. There's no magic bullet for this but uh, they're all types of technologies that we, we should consider in mine water management, oil sands, water treatment, and so forth. Now, all these in-situ treatments are really just um, in-place applications of bioreactor technology, and modern-day treatment wetlands are designed as 
uh, essentially as a bioreactor where the plants facilitate some of the uh, hydrology and the, the movement of water as well as provide a nutrient source. And so we'll get into each, that in each of the different um, explainer videos. The way they all end up working is something that sounds really complicated, which is coupled biogeochemical reactions. If you break that down, all that means is bio for biology, geo for geology or geochemistry, and chemical for chemistry. So you have a reaction that involves biology, geology, and chemistry all together at once. And these different components of the reaction play different roles. Um, that sounds complicated and really, I, I guess maybe it is, I, I did nine years of university to end up doing a postdoc in that. But um, when you think of it at its simplest form, it's not that much different than any other science or even really like baking a cake where you know the different ingredients do different things. And if you increase one ingredient or decrease one, some have bigger impacts than another. If you are baking a cake and you triple the amount of baking soda you've put in it, that's gonna have a big impact on like how it like expands and maybe some saltiness and a few things like that. Um, if you triple the amount of chocolate chips in it, everyone's just gonna love you, okay? So just saying, know what you're tripling. <laughs> so on the other side here, there's also what makes it semi-passive. And again, I know I'm kind of jumping around. This is all gonna be written out on the website. So please go there and check that out too. If you want more information or I'm not making sense. So what makes it semi-passive? So you would have low or no day-to-day -day operational activity, meaning electricity, um, chemicals being added, and human intervention. So you don't have someone out there going and turning a knob every day or every minute. You don't have membranes being exchanged and so forth. Um, so active treatment would be things like reverse osmosis, ion exchange, lime treatment, where it's ongoing, always um, people continuing the reaction. Whereas over here, it's generally microbes continuing the reactions. Um, in terms of maintenance, these semi-passive systems still have periodic planned maintenance. Okay, so they aren't walk away, they do need some upkeep. The maintenance usually decreases over time, situational dependent, and they are designed with adaptive management strategies. So you know what to do when certain things happen. You have a response plan, an action plan to prevent um, risks from becoming problems. So along these, I'm gonna leave adaptive management for another explainer video, but I wanna use an analogy for the periodic maintenance and semi-passive. So if you were to um, move into a house and you are living in there and you do no maintenance, that would be passive. You don't clean it, you don't wash the sink, you don't reshingle the roof. Yes, you could live in there for a while, depending on how passive you are and how okay you are with clutter. Maybe you do a little bit, maybe you clean the house, but you don't bother to shingle or to replace cracks or worry about when the basement floods. So over time, that house's condition and ability to serve as a house is going to deteriorate. And we all have different tolerances about what that would look like. Now, if you're gonna live semi-passively in the house, you would do things like ensure you upkeep the shingles. You would um, make sure that if the toilet gets plugged, you fix it. You would repaint the house and you have a schedule for this. You would know in advance, it's planned. You know how long your shingles last and you get them replaced. You plan ahead for it, you budget for it. And so that's an example of semi-passive in, um, in water treatment, where you're gonna have things that you know need to be maintained, but you're not actually day-to-day -day building that house in this example. Or maybe another analogy would be if active treatment was using your house as an Airbnb or even a bed and breakfast day-to-day -day where you are taking care of everybody and making sure that thing is beautiful and Instagram-worthy and everything. So there's that level, which would be active. Semi-passive is making sure the thing is cared for, no major problems arise, and you know that you have a good solid house to live in or good water treatment system. And then the passive, depending what your house is, maybe you live in one of those like castles somewhere that have stone everywhere and have been there for a thousand years and don't need much maintenance. It depends what you've chosen to live in or to treat your water and you need to pair them up accordingly. 
So we're going to talk more about the adaptive management and how this maintenance works individually for the different ones at the different explainer videos. I just hit 10 minutes, so I'm going to stick to my word and turn this off now. Thanks very much for your time and please do follow up on the website for more information.